Ready to go, Josh? Yeah. Well, good morning. We'll go ahead and call our meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everyone here. We've got some really important topics to uh, discuss today. Uh, some that I really, uh, really can uh, have issues with uh, throughout the state and through the uh, disadvantaged communities that surround uh, where we farm. So, uh, Josh, would you? Uh, we need a flag salute, don't we? Let's start with a flag salute. <laughs> Not on the agenda here. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, Josh, would you uh, do the roll call for us? Ray Cheryl Arismendi, Ashley Boren, Don Bransford, Here. Don Cameron, Here. Nancy Cassidy, Here. Helene Dillard, Here. Mike Gallo, Here. Crystal Haling, Eric Holst, Jeff Huckabee, Bryce Lumberg, Here. Martha Montoya, Here. Frank Moeller, Here. Joy Sterling, Here. Andy Thulin. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thanks, Josh. Um, we've got the uh, minutes from our last meeting that we need to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay, Secretary Ross, we have our uh, departmental update. This will be quick because I just started to look at what did we do last month? <laughs> a lot. Um, there's a, just a few items that are um, um, high level at this time. One is, as you know, um, we're still working with the federal government and with the industry on trying to figure out the E. coli and romaine. Um, the leafy green food safety program truly is one of the most remarkable programs I've seen. It's transformed an industry, the culture of food safety, the commitment from the newest worker in the field all the way through the packing plants. And to still have this issue of not being able to do um, a definitive traceback. So the um, industry led the way on creating a new work group. It was announced um, late last week. We'll be working very closely with state um, Department of Public Health, as well as our inspection services, FDA, CDC, the industry, academics, Arizona um, Department of, of Agriculture to figure this one out. That's our commitment um, to the public um, um, to be able to do that. But it's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking um, to see the illnesses, one death, um, and the impact to the industry at the retail and the fields that are being farmed under. So um, that, that's occupied a lot of May. And then um, we announced two weeks ago the discovery of virulent Newcastle disease, which when we had this 15 years ago, it was named exotic Newcastle disease. Um, it, it's ironic or maybe fortuitous that the week before the discovery, uh, CDFA, along with most states across the nation, participated in a national exercise. Yeah. Um, many states learned with avian influenza a couple of years ago that there was a lot more need for biosecurity training and rapid response improvement. And I am so proud of our animal health division. Dr. Annette Jones is a great leader. We've learned the hard way on biosecurity. We work closely with the industry. We have great practices in place. We do routine exercises, and the national exercise was especially informative. And I, sorry, I, that's a call I've been waiting for, but I'll take it later. Um, during that three-day exercise, I will tell you, my heart would race when I would get this. It was always a reminder, this is an exercise we've learned from Hawaii. This is an exercise, but you saw what the impact could be. We actually did a drill on foot and mouth disease. Um, so I was definitely ready, but it didn't want to be <laughs> when the real deal was discovered. So far, um, the findings have been in very small backyard flocks of game birds um, in um, Los Angeles County and San Bernardino County. 
We've deployed most of our animal health division and have called for volunteers from across the department. It's a great partnership with USDA. Like all things that we do, it would not work without our strong partnership with USDA and the really great communications and sharing, you know, clearly defining roles and responsibilities and, and sticking with that. So who knows how long this will last. Um, 15 years ago, it was 11 months. And it was intense, 24-7, every day. So that's occurring now, along with continued finds of HLB positive trees in backyards in Los Angeles, a few in Riverside County. I always stress that we have still been successful at keeping um, the, the disease isolated in these backyards. Uh, it complicates our life, as you can imagine, going door to door. Uh, but keeping it away from commercial production is still our, our primary goal, and we're working very closely with the industry on that. This is, uh, we're in the two weeks getting ready for budget, and we've been doing a lot of legislative meetings on that. Um, conference committee started meeting this week, and so hopefully we'll have a clear picture and we'll all be enlightened um, by next Friday, June 15th. <laughs> Uh, we are still waiting for an announcement from USDA on the results of the producer vote, um, whether to join the federal milk marketing order. We believe because of the block voting of cooperatives, it probably will go that way, but we cannot do any of the work that we need to do to prepare for that until there's a formal announcement. And then we are busy, even though it won't happen until September. Time flies around here. I can't believe we have less than seven months in office uh, for the Global Climate Action Summit. And um, we will be hosting one of the official affiliate events, which will take us to Marin and Sonoma County uh, for the two days prior to the summit. So uh, a lot of work going into that. Josh is deeply engaged with that because he doesn't have enough to do. And I think Jenny feels like all of her other policy work is put on suspense while we plan for the summit. It's a, it's a big undertaking. So those are some of the key issues, um, along with the routine stuff that happens around here. It is, I want to remind everyone, it is fair season. So if you haven't been to your local fair, I'm sure you'll have that chance soon. Excellent. You know, the Secretary, I was wondering, did the, does the, you know, the uh, Newcastle diseases and the proliferation of all the backyard chicken growers, is, is that going to create a larger problem, possibly? Or? Yeah, I mean, clearly that was a complicating factor <clears throat> 15 years ago, which was also in Southern California. And it's much too early. I've learned this from the scientists. You know, I'm not one about... Epidemi epidemiolo epidemiolo you know, yes. the epi curve. I'm just going to shortcut that. The epi curve, and it's too early to know for sure on things like that. And it's also too early to know if vaccination is helping. I mean, I look at this, and I like to jump to conclusions too quickly, but a lot of backyard flo flocks do tend to be vaccinated. We know that vaccination is used more extensively, but it's too early to know what the true impact is going to be. But I am being very hopeful that that may mitigate um, the, the full impact from what we saw 15 years ago and what we're seeing so far. But it's still very early in this find, very early in this find. Uh, thank you. I know they're, they're cared for extremely well <laughs> from what I hear. Okay, we're going to go ahead and shift into uh, gear here with our... Uh, I, I do want to stress so far, it, it started with game birds. That's a game very birds. important distinction. Yes. And I'll, I'll explain that all to you later. Yep. I, under, I understand gaming. Exhibition. <laughs> there you go. Ex or ex exhibition. Right. <laughs> okay, we're going to move into our uh, primary topic today, which is going to be uh, broadband and uh, California's uh, situation, which unfortunately isn't that great um <laughs> well that was a pretty blunt well it depends we i, I tell you what it, it it really it depends where you live it's all loc <laughs> it's all about loc lo lo it's like lo about location so <laughs> i'll i'll leave it at that and i'll i'll introduce uh aubrey bettencourt uh, aubrey is the state executive director for usda california farm service agency appointed by the trump administration in november 2017 
Previously, Aubrey served us as the Executive Director of the California Water Alliance. Aubrey is also a farmer who oversees the business operation and land management of Benton Court Farms, which is located to the uh, southeast of where I farm, which is, uh, and you're in, you are in Kings County, aren't you? Yes. Yep. So welcome. Good morning and thank you very much for uh, this quick time. I wanted to provide a quick update on uh, some of the activities going on at USDA and more specifically with the Farm Service Agency as relates to uh, our operations here within California. I understand you have an aggressive agenda dealing with broadband. I believe you also have a colleague of ours from rural development who's far more focused on that and that aspect of it. But critical to our role at, at FSA uh, with regards to uh, our, our our understanding of, of our role as we all work together within the USDA model is rural communities and a critical part of the rural economy is agriculture. Um, our, our, our success of our farms and our farming businesses within the rural communities are also critical to that connectivity as it is our markets in the global economy that bring connectivity to our rural communities as well. So having that broadband connectivity not only helps emphasize a strong economy for our farms and a connected economy as we know we are as a, I'm an unapologetic California farm girl, we are the best. Um, I don't apologize for it. Um, and this is that aspect of that connectivity between our, our businesses, um, you know, little farms in Kings County, in Humboldt, in Indio, in, in uh, Imperial are connected to markets all over the world. And so having the actual technology to not only connect our, our businesses, but also educate our workforce, connect our workforce, connect our communities, only help keep our farms productive and strong and powerful and dominant in their field, but also the communities to do the same and follow suit with that. So there, there's a definite connection to our work at FSA and supporting the work of our, our colleagues at RD and, and the subject that you're focusing on today. But I wanted to take, like I said, just a quick minute to give you a quick update on what's happening at, uh, at FSA. Farm Service Agency, as, as you know, has two sides of its house. We have our loan side and our program side. The oversimplified version of what we do is we administer the farm bill. Or as I like to tell people, everything that FSA has creates a patchwork quilt working with every grower who walks through the door to, one, keep farmers farming, Two, when disaster strikes, get them back to farming as quickly as possible. And three, help find new farmers and give them the best opportunity for success. Everything that FSA provides accomplishes those three things or works towards those three things. Um, our, our offices in California, we have 32 offices statewide, including our main office headquarters over in Davis. We stretch from the border at Imperial, uh, our office in, in El Centro, all the way up to Wairica and Alturas. Uh, in Modoc and Siskiyou County. I've been to all but nine. I will see all of the remaining nine by the end of July, or the end of June. So I'm actually leaving here to head up to uh, Modoc and Siskiyou. So very excited about that. We have an incredibly dedicated workforce. I can speak to that. Um, uh, and, and with an amazing amount of institutional knowledge, both for their locality, but also for the history of the various programs that FSA has administered over time. I think we have an excellent team who, let's be honest, Farm Bill's not always written for California. So when you have an experienced workforce with over 30 years of experience in some cases, and even some of our newbies coming online, um, their job is to have amazing creativity, and my job is to foster that, where they can take something written for soybeans, make it apply to peaches, and we can rock and roll with our farmers getting services out the door for them to keep doing what they do. Um, right now, there's some restructuring happening over at USDA. I want to walk you through some of that. Currently, what has happened is we've created a new mission area, which we lovingly call FPAC, or the Farm Production and Conservation Services. What's happened is we are very focused, and the drive from Secretary Purdue is on three main components. He wants to create USDA to be the most efficient, effective, and customer-focused agency in the federal government. A critical part of that is this new FPAC mission area, where the three outward-facing or customer-interfacing agencies are now put together. Those three agencies are Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. We all three have the most direct in interaction with our producers uh, from, a, from a traditional farm background or from a, a, a traditional agricultural standpoint. And our, our, our entire focus is, again, to be focused on that customer. So as we continue to restructure in that direction, um, currently, just to, to help handle any misnomers, the biggest thing we're arguing right now is who gets to handle the cars. So we're right now, in that sense, creating a new business center. 
and that business center is looking at all of the more back-end nitty-gritty stuff that we do that we all overlap lap on in terms of the services that we provide our own staff in order for us to keep providing uh, services out the door to our customers. So right now we're looking at creating some internal efficiencies um, to uh, as we focus on keeping our staff focused on, pro on providing services to the producer. Um, that's all happening more at the DC level. Um, and uh, and a number of those um, kind of the biggest things that we've seen so far again has just been sort of this realignment looking at at putting those three agencies together into one mission area. Um, heading forward to that though, you will see a couple of things. And the way I interpret this mission of efficient, effective, and customer focus is we invest in our, the way you become efficient and effective is you invest in your people and your technology. And I think you're starting to see more of that uh, from, from USDA, from a national standpoint, but also from, for, as it permeates out to the states. I would encourage you to visit farmers.gov. This is going to be the new customer interface platform for USDA. It's becoming more dynamic by day and we're actually soliciting user in input and helping us develop this product out. Um, we're looking at moving towards where the tech, the best way I could explain this is, our agency has a very short period of time as, as USDA to get caught up to where our industry already is. Um, I think in California, we have the luxury of being, uh, being the Silicon Valley of ag in many ways, and so we've embraced technology uh, early on in the industry nationwide and worldwide has in many ways as well. The federal USDA is starting to do that as well. Farmers.gov will be the new user face platform for that, where producers will be able to pull applications, be able to pull interactive information, be able to see how their operation fits into some of our programs, be able to contact and find more easily where our offices are located and make those appointments to have those services available to them. So it's going to become this new, uh, newer uh, communications platform. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Just some quick updates going forward, uh, what we see coming down the pike for FSA. Um, we're rolling out what some would call a mini farm bill. The continuing resolution in April made a number of critical changes to, to key programs within California, including our tree assistance program, our TAP, um, the uh, margin protection, price protection program for our dairies, or MPP. Um, we also saw changes to our um, emergency livestock assistance program, or ELAP, as well as our livestock indemnity program. And finally, the creation of the new WIP program, which is the wildfire hurricane indemnity program. What's critical to understand is all of these changes will be coming online, if not already, as we've seen the MPP program, and many thanks to Secretary Ross for assisting in our reaching our producers on that program. Um, our ELAP and LIP program just opened for application again. This is where anyone who experienced disaster over the last 2017, 2018 season, critical to us from our livestock producer standpoint with regards to wildfires and mudslides, can come in and make changes to their application to take advantage of the changes made during the continuing resolution. More importantly, the remainder of these programs, WIP, um, a, a new cotton seed program as well. These are all going to be coming online in July. So our biggest focus right now is, um, well, I was always told growing up, you focus on what you can control, not what you can't control. So what we're working on for the month of June is let's get everything we can within our control uh, at the county level, like acreage reporting, which is the most critical of all when it comes to implementing these programs. Let's get those out of the way now, get our producers in the door now, make sure they're very clear on what's coming down the pike so they know what they have. What they, have, what, what they qualify for, what they have to qualify for that to get that service made as, as swiftly and, and conveniently as possible as all of these programs are gonna come online starting around July 16th. Um, and those programs will run just a short period of time uh, as we roll them out through the remainder of the fiscal year. So we're looking at a very busy mid-summer to end of fiscal year for, for our county offices. Um, we're, we're rolling out and I hope to be coming to you soon with um, more information trying to create kind of an FSA summer roadmap so our producers can look real quick and say, yep, I qualify for that, that's what I need to have, here's where I go to make my appointment, get in, get out the door. Um, our job, and I take it very seriously, is to support our California farmers in every way possible. Um, there's no room for discrimination of any kind. Farmers are, are in the minority no matter where you go, and we wanna see them be successful, and like I said, I don't apologize for the dominance of our California farmers, and I'm gonna keep them there as long as I'm here. So. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to, to assist or feel free to contact me on the aside. Um, we have a very short period of time to get a lot of good work done and I look forward to working with you all going forward. Thank you. Aubrey, thank you very much. Um, I guess what, what are your priorities here for California at the state level and is there anything we can do to help you out? Um, 
communication is probably key. Um, we have a very unique relationship to our producers when it comes to FSA, I think, compared to our counterparts in places like Iowa and Georgia, um, where it's generational how much they relate to the farm service agency right. out there. Um, the joke is if a Georgia farmer can't see an FSA office when he's having his morning coffee, he That's has true. a heart attack. Um, that is true. It's part of their culture. We don't have that here. Right. Um, in many ways, California farmers, speaking as one, we're too good at what we do. Um, and, and so what my priority, I would say, in, in communicating is going to be key for us uh, is reestablishing and redefining the new relationship FSA could have with its California growers in the sense of um, helping get into compliance because we have very strict different rules from parts of the United States. I think FSA could be helpful in that. I think we could be very helpful in coming online with it, with meeting various challenges um, uh, with regards to emission standards and and uh, and climate change standards and health and public health standards. I think we have a lot of opportunities between our loan side and our program side to really assist with that. Um, I find it. Uh, it's challenging, um, it's surprising, but one of our greatest recruitment tools, sadly, is natural disaster. We gain our greatest number of new producers through natural disaster. I would like to see that changed, and I think a partnership with, with your entity would be very helpful with regards to that. Not that we haven't had a great partnership in rolling that out, and quite frankly, that's one of my uh, priorities, I would say, is um, um, I'm already being asked by my counterparts in other states, but I think California FSA will end up leading FSA with regards to disaster response. Um, and I'm, I've been spending a lot of time focusing on that coming out of the wildfires and mudslides of this last year, really looking at how we can be better and more responsive. And I will say that thanks to some of the messaging that we created, actually the changes in our emergency livestock assistance program went to pay as you go. That came directly out of our programs here where unfortunately the word emergency just meant when the program triggered, it didn't actually mean responsiveness. Now it means responsiveness. The moment a producer comes in, can prove the losses to a livestock, we get the check out the door within eight to 10 days and get them back on their feet. And that's what these programs should be doing. Can I? I, I just, it's really important to note that Aubrey and Kim got named, and because they got named like on a Friday, Secretary Purdue came to California for the first time on a Sunday, and it was almost the next week that we had the fires, and I cannot tell you, I don't think you stayed at home th <laughs> for that period. She was out there, Kim was out there, they were everywhere. They saw immediately some things that needed to change, and this is the result. So I just can't say enough good things about how you just jumped in, and they are women who are going to make things happen. I'm just telling you. Takes one to know one. Thank you. <laughs> Audrey, uh, thank you uh, for coming and sharing um, your thoughts. Also, congratulations on your appointment. and. I, too, would like to compliment your staff. I mean, your field people are very, very dedicated um, and uh, greatly appreciated by those of us that, that utilize their services. On your, on your farmers.gov website, are, you know, are you going to put maps on there, the FSA maps? You know, I, uh, I, I took my reporting in, my acreage, I, acreage reports. Thank you. But you know what I found out? We're going to hundreds this year. And I went, what? And you know it would be it would be nice if there was a way to access those maps, uh, and and there's probably all kinds of reasons why legally you can't do that. But if we could ever uh, access those those maps with the track numbers and the field numbers and the acreages, that that would really uh, be helpful. Because um, I've been to, excuse me, Don, are you talking about hundreds of a acre? Yeah, it's not like 8.5 acres. It's 8.49 acres this year. Oh. So, I mean, I had no idea, I, you know, and, but now, did, did I have to do that? No, Cindy did it. So, I mean, I was thankful, I was thankful for that because the office took care of it, but, um, but anyway, it would be nice to have access to that. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but um, I do know we are looking into some changes within not only the, the level of technology we're utilizing for mapping, um, but also, I think the accessibility of it as well. So, um, it has definitely been made clear that a priority. It's, it's, it's. Um, gosh, I, I don't. 
I don't want to say it's a hurry up and wait, but I will tell you that when the tumblers line up with us, it comes out quickly. So right now, knowing that this conversation is happening to the extent, and I will gladly carry that, that message uh, forward as well, but I think you're going to be seeing a more open and accessible USDA and FSA, and, and I, I do believe that's a critical part of it as well. I mean, the reality of it is our growers have access to that information. What's the difference? It's theirs. So we're going to be looking into that um, over time, and I'm sure there is some, some legality. Um, involved and and I have a saying that no one looks good in orange so we're going to make sure that that we all uh, are mining our P's and Q's in that regard but I'll definitely make sure we get that information passed along and I'll take another look at it and then follow up with you yeah um, I'd like to join the chorus of saying thank you and congratulations and um, I'm sure all of the high praise is so richly deserved um, to beg the question of today's meeting, having farmers.gov is fabulous as long as people have access to it. I cannot agree with you more. And um, that's something where, again, um, you know, rural development is, I think the broadband was one of their first, uh, between that and the opioid addiction, uh, battling that within our rural communities, I know that is a massive priority within the rural development um, uh, mission area. I'm going to definitely let them uh, take the lead on that. But from a, any standpoint, and, and this is something that we're being encouraged from a national level, but definitely it is a priority among the leadership at the USDA office in Davis that we support each other regardless of mission area. So whatever FSA can do and whatever I can do to support Kim Ban and RD, we're going to make that happen. She's been very helpful and RD has been very supportive of us in responding to the wildfires as well. Um, I, I can't agree with you more. That's something I communicate back to, to uh, DC. We just had a, an appointment of our new administrator, um, uh, Richard Fordyce from um, yeah, step former secretary of, of ag from Missouri, I believe, um, Richard has been a great asset and he and I are definitely lockstep with regards to going to, um, a, a web-based platform is brilliant. So long as our producers can have access to it, so long as we can tell them about it as well. So this is an ongoing, uh, drum. I, I, I'm a massive believer in the level of communication that we can be having because I know those tools. Um, that, that is something that I have become a master in on my own, um, and I will drag folks kicking and screaming to that point because I do believe in it as well, and, and that's something that um, I'm, I beat that drum on a regular basis with the undersecretary and with our administrator. Well, thank you, Aubrey, and thank you for the significant programs that you uh, run through your um, agency. Um, and thank you for recognizing the diversity of California agriculture. It, it has uh, no doubt challenges uh, for you that uh, are unique to California with so many crops, so many commodities, so many uh, communities. Um, thank you for your comment about creativity and how to apply the, uh, the programs that maybe have one or two crops in mind. Um, and and I, uh, I have, I'm an organic farmer, and, and we utilize your programs. Your programs are well set up for all sorts of farmers, including California's organic farmers. Uh, I was wondering if, um, if um, I guess there's some folks who believe the Trump administration is, is not as supportive of uh, organic agriculture, but I have not seen that in, in my uh, engagement with FSA and with organic programs. Uh, was wondering if you uh, predict or foresee any changes in in how we would be engaging your your offices and uh, and um, programs in organic agriculture. I, no, I, I mean I I, I think uh, I go back to the tenet of keeping farmers farming regardless of of type. We want to see our farmers be successful. I mean the reality of it is we've outsourced. Uh, feeding and clothing and fueling ourselves to less than 1% of the population. We have to keep that community in every regard, whether we're talking about connectivity and education, all the way to the services they need to, to survive disaster or whatever challenges they may be facing, uh, of every type supported and give them the best opportunity for success. There is so much within agriculture, as you and I know as farmers, that is not within our control. Um, and we accept that as part of of our vocation, of our advocation. Um, but there's, if there's one thing I want California farmers to know is that uh, USDA, FSA, 
and our partners at FPAC are here to support them, whatever those challenges may be, and to give them whatever opportunity we can. Um, there, again, there, there's uh, things that are out of our control, but we're going to try to give them every opportunity and support we can, regardless of what type they are. I mean, one program that we have is we actually do help. Uh, we'll cover up to 75% of the cost for your organic certification at the state and federal level. I mean, that's something that, that we push constantly. We're very successful in, especially in Southern California. We're seeing a very unique market opportunity for that, actually, in San Diego County, where there's a lot of diversity on smaller acreage agriculture, which is really kind of our sweet spot uh, in many ways. So um, we're, we're getting ready to launch a new program with that. In fact, next week I'll be in San Diego and Imperial and in uh, 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 Indio. So... Um, pushing those programs as well. So we're, we're working, and, and I, I appreciate patience. Uh, definitely I'm going to be meeting with Secretary Ross's staff to talk about other ways we can talk about communication, especially going forward. Your tenure, I know, is coming to a close. Um, but, uh, um, you know, being able to work with you looking forward as, as we face the next couple of years with, the, with a new administration, we want to keep that, that open door and working policy, you know, working relationship together because uh, we share the same mission when it comes to that. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Aubrey. I really appreciate your time here today and learned a lot. So thank you. Okay, our, uh, our next uh, guest is Robert uh, C. Robert's a liaison for the USDA Rural, Rural Development's Te Telecommunications Program, working through the Office of the Assistant Administrator. Robert has more than 30 years of government experience at the uh, state and federal level in various leadership capacities. So, welcome, Robert. Good to see you again. Thank you. Did I get to the pulpit? Yes. Okay. Ash, does magically become? Magically come up? <laughs> like, uh, do I push a button or uh, anything? Okay. Here we go. Wow, 30 years. It doesn't seem like 30 years. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Well, it's been fun the whole time, and I still remember where the bathrooms are in this building from before, so. The most important piece of it. It is like, you know, any visit to any country, any building, it's where the bathroom is, and the language to find it, um, of stuff. So I guess this has come up, so I'm going to give you a highlight of the USDA telecommunications broadband programs, but first, what I thought I would, oops. Well, <laughs> top button? Try it. No? There we go. It was the top, I guess. Okay, well, first, um, so those of you who know me, I do everything by PowerPoint. I don't write text anymore. Um, and this, again, it's important to set the context, which you all well know. But to a non-California or to an urban audience, you have to really drive home the point that rural, in terms of geography, is 95% of the state of California. It's not all urban where the population is. Um, and that gets to the broadband argument. Let's see. Oops. There we go. And then, again, um, that slide is, I'm not going to read through it, but it's basically to put up there that there's all these layers um, in the rural areas where broadband is the platform for rural prosperity. And I just went and identified all these various layers there. The most recent is agriculture technology, because essentially if I do it in a sound bite, it doesn't work unless you've got broadband access in the farm field, which up to this point, almost no one has looked at that component of broadband in rural areas into the farm field. Um, that is to illustrate that it is, uh, you shouldn't be thinking of broadband as solely a rural or an urban aspect. The two are connected, and that's, including with sound, um, that chart illustrates that. I would say on the left that data agrolytics, which is the new term, um, instead of data analytics, it's data, data agrolytics, which takes all the farm sensor data and goes through this whole process, combining with um, agricultural analysis and done in the cloud and comes back. Um, it's a description of what you're doing now um, in terms of farming using the new ag technology. Again, doesn't work without broadband and the urban areas need to realize that they're interrelated to all of this. It doesn't work. The cloud is somewhere um, and so it all interacts. 
Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to quickly go through the USDA broadband programs. Um, the, bond, the first from the 50,000 foot level, um, since fiscal year 2010, uh, Rural Utility Service at USDA has invested $6.2 billion in broadband infrastructure across the U.S. Um, so that's, that's a significant investment, and we have essentially four, and now five, broadband programs. Two are loans, which I'll go through real quickly, telecommunications infrastructure, and the Farm, bond, farm Bill broadband program, and two grant programs, Community Connect and Distance Learning. There is a new program, uh, the broadband pilot program, which Congress created this year. Um, I'll say something about it at the end. That's a brand new program. It's not out yet, um, but it's an opportunity to look at. Um, if you look at, real quickly, the two uh, broadband loan programs, and there we go. There's the Telecommunications Infrastructure Program. It was funded in 2018 to $690 million, so it's not an insignificant amount of money. I will say all the programs are oversubscribed, um, so it's an important thing. This is, in a way, a legacy program because it goes back originally to the rural telephone programs uh, where, and in fact, I think the authorizing legislation goes back to 1934, um, and it was used to bring rural telephone service out. So um, as a result of that telephone legacy, it actually doesn't have a specific definition of broadband service in terms of speeds um, because that wasn't part of it. Um, so it's up to the applicant to establish that. Um, it also doesn't establish the minimum new service, but basically the common sense thing is it needs to be competitive to what is available. This is a, uh, the funding cycle of this. They take, they're taking rolling applications, so it's still open until September 30th of this year. And um, I won't go through who may apply, but I will say that it's um, funding for construction and maintenance of broadband infrastructure. It includes telephone systems. The eligible areas are towns with a population of 5,000 or less. So for those of you who look at USDA programs and particularly rural development programs, they all have a slightly different definition of what rural is based on population. It will slowly drive you crazy because each one is different. And I'm only talking about right here, the broadband programs, just so you know that. Um, if we go to the Farm Bill broadband program, and it's called that because I think it was the last Farm Bill that it came about um, in, and um, that program is funded to $29.9 million this year. Again, this is a rolling uh, application process, so it's still open. In this particular case, the loan amounts one could apply for is between $100,000 to $25 million. Again, funds are used for cost of construction of a broadband network. Um, in this case, the eligible rural communities are 20,000 or less. 15% of households must be unserved, and you cannot have three or more incumbent service providers, broadband providers, in that area. Here they define uh, what minimum service is, and it's 25 MBPS down and three up, which is the FCC standard um, that they use. So that's an important consideration because I know there's a, if you look at California rules, they're not exactly the same. It's, it's, there's a variation that, it, again, it's one of those things that will slowly drive you crazy. Um, these are the, the two grant programs, Community Connect, we have here. The Community Connect program, um, it's funded to $30 million this year. It closed for applications this fiscal year on May 14th, so they're just starting to process them. Grant amounts, $100,000 to $3 million. Um, eligible areas, 20000 or less. The service area has to be entirely unserved. And unserved is defined as 10 MBPS download and one up. So it doesn't mean exactly zero. So you have to follow the definition of what is unserved. And there's a 15% match. 
requirement. Whatever proposal comes in, it's supposed to build it to, a, to 25 and 3, which is the FCC standard. So there's some sort of outer technical requirements um, there. Um, I guess we can skip over this. We'll go over to the distance learning telemedicine program. I've actually worked on a part of this because I've shifted from where I was into the telecommunications unit at USDA. Um, here, what's interesting is the Congress put in funding for this year at $29 million and added $20 million for distance learning telemedicine applications that deal with the opioid crisis, so that would get you to telemedicine in rural areas, and or STEM education, which is a new emphasis. Um, it literally closed yesterday for applications. Um, grant amounts 50,000 to 500,000, 15% match required. Let's see, we'll skip through this. I will say the the fifth program, which is brand new, the broadband pilot program, which Congress created this year, um, it's funded to $600 million. It's brand new. So what will happen is it'll actually be probably a $1.2 billion program because it will be a combination of grants and loans. And the department right now is formulating how that program will be administered. So there actually is no more information on that. It will probably take mm, six months to a year to put that together in terms of regulations to come out. I would say that that is a great opportunity for California to take a look at for applications because it's A, new money, and B, there, isn't, there is still an, the process is open right now, so I believe they will be soliciting for public input sometime uh, in July. Um, for how what you think the program should do or how it should be administered. And it's an important opportunity for California to figure out this is what you have in California. These are the constraints. How could this program help with that? And I will just add in my editorial side of this, I put my California hat on. I would also try to figure out how to make that program leveraged against California resources, because other people here will speak later you have on the agenda about that. Now, for anyone who is interested in the actual details of applying, and the rules do, do change, we have what are called general field representatives across the country, and Rocky Chenille is the general field representative for California. So if you are or an entity is interested in doing an application or has questions, you would contact Rocky, and in many cases you could the applicant can run their ideas by and sort of check before they even get into the process, which is important um, you know, before they go forward. Because sometimes there are barriers that uh, you can't overcome and you need, just need to figure that out. Um, I want to add one more thing as part of the idea. This is on broadband. Yeah, that's the part of it's to wake you up. But actually, if the point of this meeting is to talk about the importance of broadband, in rural areas. And one of the things that I think is new, that's going to be a new user or customer for broadband that has not been there before is on the rural manufacturing side. And this is driven by technology developments. And what is happening is that um, you, you have this high performance uh, computing which is out there is essentially is in the cloud, which enables what I call what we call additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is a descendant of the 3D printer. And it's almost here where you could start to manufacture all kinds of products, including products with different metals combined. That's how far advanced it is, is getting. Um, what it makes possible is the ability to produce one or two small lot or one off products economically. It's the exact opposite of, you know, if you know the economics and the mass scale of mass production of, of products. This could, this could actually be a big, well, in Pennsylvania's case, a revival of rural industrial jobs. And here, we're less like that, but it could create a whole new era of rural industrial production that's essentially artisan-like. 
small one-off products, customized to what your local needs are. It is going to be a very high bandwidth user of broadband because everything is done in the cloud, and that's coming. So I think that if you build the broadband system that can accommodate that, it's going to happen here in California. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you. Really uh, interesting, Robert. Uh, I guess, you know, looking at the number of grants and money and loan ava uh, availability, um, how much, I mean, I, I know there's a huge need throughout the United States, so what portion does this cover? I, I mean, how, how far will you get with the money that's been invested or that you have available right now, per, I guess maybe percentage-wise, and how much is headed toward California? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let's be honest. Well, <laughs> Rocky would tell you that California doesn't get its fair share, and I, and um, it doesn't get its fair share in a lot of things. But I I don't think it really does get its fair share. However, you want to measure proportionality or anything, um, I think some of the challenge is that for some reason the situation in California somehow doesn't exactly align to some of the requirements of the programs. That's essentially what Rocky would say, um, even though there's a lot of potential there. And I'm probably not supposed to talk any more about that since now I'm wearing the department hat on that. So I toss that out, though, as something that you need to look at from a California perspective. You could talk with Rocky about it for the technical aspect and then figure out the solution to that. It's either you have the state of California funds and you figure out, okay, this is what we have, like CETF um, that works on things. Or um, you do have the opportunity, Farm Bill is this year, Farm Bill contains all the rules, regulations, uh, and authorized appropriations for all our farm programs. Take a look at it. If there's a technical change that's needed to fit California, if that's what it is, then advocate for it. I, I'm going to ask the same question again. I, I need some perspective as to, okay, use high-speed broadband or some l lesser level, but what are we talking about in dollars investment? I mean, what it, for California, how much is it, would it cost to get us to high-speed broadband or um, st on a, in the rural area or statewide, mm -hmm. and, and then what percentage of that total are these dollars that you just went through, uh, will they contribute? Because I, I just, I have, I have no idea what, what that is. That, that actually is a, it's a very di difficult question to answer the cost of it and the extent because of the sort of amorphous nature of when you of broadband and the geographic area. But I, the best thing you could think about is this, is New York State. Three years ago, Governor Cuomo, in his State of the State address, said that broadband was the number one priority for economic development in the state of New York. That broadband today is the equivalent for New York State that the interstate highway system, when it was built in the 50s and 60s, in creating this uh, unified network that drove, econo that drove economic growth in the state of New York. So in his state of the state address, he proposed that they build a statewide New York broadband system and pledged $500 million of New York state money to be leveraged at raising another 500 million from the private sector. At the end of this year, they are scheduled to finish the system to hook up all of New York, including rural areas. So there are stories, if you go out and look, there are some stories from even last summer in the New York Times about how a dairy farm in New York was hooked up and it made the transformative aspect for their business because A, on the input side, they can now go out and uh, competitively check what all the input costs are, much more so than they could before. And then on their sales side, it opened up the market to this whole range of folks to sell things. So it was a positive thing for them. It's quite transformative in their business. $500 million. And the New York standard is this. 
the New York, if the FCC standard and the standards you see here are this 25-3 business, 25 down and three up, the New York state standard is 100. And that 100 standard is what, I, I read this, because I read all this stuff, I, I, I actually read an FCC staff report that was about five years ago predicting the future or talking about what the future standards we should have for broadband as a country. And they talked about 100 should be the new standard for various reasons. New York went, and went ahead and adopted that. So what I would say is you can get two things out of this. One, I think it does take state leadership to drive it because this was Governor Cuomo's project to drive. And now New York has better broadband than California. So it's the throwdown challenge. And they looked to the future uh, because there's a whole nother set of folks out there who say you don't need 100 at this point. But remember, when these, these smartphones, well, I mean, it's over there, when the phones came out and the cell phones, they, they underbuilt the system to handle it. And so I, I would say on the broadband side, because of the demand uh, for capacity, you can't, you just, you cannot overbuild it because it will be filled up right away. Well, thank you very much. I just fainted about six times that somehow New York got ahead of us. But I want to make sure that I completely, completely understand this. And I know 500 million is a lot of money, but in the context, it doesn't sound that big. It sounds so doable. Do I have that correct? It took $500 million to wire the entire state of New York. Uh, that's what the state invested into it. I, I believe they actually also leveraged it into 500 million from the private sector. So the total investment was $1 billion. But when you think about it, Put it in these terms, that if the state, if within the state of California there was an investment of $1 billion for broadband, and, and New York did not draw a distinction between rural and urban. They did the whole state, but primarily the geographic area um, was rural, um, tying the whole state together. Um, if they can do that for $1 billion, here's your comparison. How much did it cost to build the Bay Bridge? X billions of dollars, right? So for the cost of maybe 25% of the Bay Bridge or 10% of the Bay Bridge, you could light up the state. So the point is this, as infrastructure, we all know there are huge infrastructure needs at all levels across the country in every state. It's the best deal because it's price per mile or access. It's an incredible deal to do. And the other thing to remember is, to, and not to be confused, is broadband technology, like all technology, continuously advances at very rapid rates. So if we talked about what the best literal physical broadband technology was around five years ago, it's already obsolete. It's been replaced by something that is more efficient, faster, and cheaper today. So that it's a great deal. Also, when you said their standards was 100, that's 100 down and up? Uh, I'm not positive on the up part. It's, I don't think it was equal across. There's a whole other debate if you want to get into that. Um, but the 100 down is the, is the part that will affect you the most. Well, except on the reporting end. One of the things that we need yes. to do, particularly thinking about agriculture, is being able to report True. the information, and that's going to become more and more and more critical, particularly when it's water, what right. nitrates, whatever it is. So we need also up right. capacity. I just want to make that clarification. The up part is where I would say there needs to be a discussion about what that level is, because there is a debate out there um, from the technology side that the speed should be equal both directions. Um, I'm not sure right now on the, ag, on, the, on the ag side for the sensors and the, the data that has to be transmitted if it, it inherently needs much higher speed right now. But I think that obviously it will expand. I will tell you that 
if you want rural telemedicine or telesurgery, you've got to have both because it's, it's both directions that's important. I don't want someone, op, you know, a robot operating on me and the signal goes out in the middle. <laughs> that's, that's the future. So I had a basic question. So where does the money go? We talk about infrastructure and implementation. So if we're investing all this money to different awards, different communities, who's receiving the money and what's it actually doing on the ground? Well, the, the, the way it's worked is it's, uh, you will have, uh, I guess I call them entities that build our, and administer broadband communications and they tend to be the applicants for them. So you can have a consortia a group, but the eligible applicants are actually state government, county government, private entities. So there are third party entities out there. The Digital 395, which was a stimulus funded project from USDA, which runs essentially from Carson City down US 395 on the backside of the Sierras to Barstow, um, was I think the single, uh, maybe the single largest USDA broadband project that was funded, and it was um, a, a nonprofit cooperative, essentially, that built it. Now, that is a very good example where they built for the future, because they built that for a two terabyte capacity. It's, it's, it's like put in 40, because the, uh, the it, just for so you know, the most expensive part of building broadband, if you're putting in fiber, is digging the trench. That's probably 50 to 75 percent of the cost of it. Putting in the fiber for the capacity is almost inconsequential, which is why they put in something like 47 strands of fiber, because 47 versus 1 was inconsequential. So why not do it? But they now, I believe, that area of California, this is the first time a rural area on any kind of infrastructure has better infrastructure than any urban area in the U.S. Now it's up to them to figure out how to exploit that, but you can see the opportunities. So this is not a question for Robert. It's a question for the board, because I come from the land of public power districts, cooperatives for both electricity and for telephones, and we have a few still remaining rural telephone companies who have done quite a bit of work on this. But I look at all the organizations we have as part of our rural infrastructure, and of course there's fairgrounds, but there's also water districts. And I'm just wondering if we're not thinking enough about what the possibilities could be when it comes to rural utilities, meaning broadband, if there is a there there. And so I'm looking at how many of you are on some of those boards, if that's even remotely possible to the board members themselves. I think it would be based on size of the district. For instance, our district probably could manage something like that because, uh, you know, we've got a lot more size and capacity than some of the <coughs> districts that are 10 or 15,000 acres. And, um, and, you know, and the technology in all of water districts is greatly changing. I mean, as we go to measurement, I mean, it used to be you know, how much, how much diversion out of the main canal. Now it's laterals and then fields, and, and some districts have gone to telemetry individual fields. So that, that just generates huge amounts of data uh, that has to be managed. And as, as the state and the federal government measurement requirements increase, that, you know, it's just huge. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Don. I think with sustainable groundwater management uh, coming coming into effect in 2020, you know, the need for measurement of water use and water uh, levels throughout your GSA are going to be critical. And and right now we don't have the technology, and so maybe there is a good fit. But but is it you know in in that case is that a is that a irrigation district responsibility or a DWR responsibility uh, that's managing or the Bureau of Reclamation that's managing these programs you know I, I don't know um, but um, yeah, I think we'd have to rewrite some of our bylaws right, to be able right. to cover because currently yeah. that's not one of our. Yeah. 
just, things that we're, yeah, we're, we're responsible for. Yeah, because it could be that it's too much of a diversion, or it could be an enhanced new business service and new profits. I mean, who knows? I just wonder about that. But I, I'm taking us away from staying on agenda. But I think it's something like to really try to think outside that box. Yeah. Yeah. No, a lot to think about, Joy. I, I just want to add to the needs category, um, playing off of what you were talking about. You mentioned the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds are essential, as we know from the wildfires, mm -hmm. um, that the fairgrounds are, uh, to me, that would be a fabulous anchor, if you will, because we need to have the highest, most resilient, redundant form of communication because there are that's where the first responders are. Yeah. And so... And once we have that in place, perhaps from there we can. Right. Well, I, yeah. What we heard when we did the did the tour through the fire areas uh, early this spring was that first thing that happened, everybody lost communication because uh, internet went down, cell phone towers, uh, all the everything was burned. And so, yeah, central location for communication uh, is vital when you have a natural disaster. True. Yeah. Right. They were able to communicate. Yeah. Okay. Robert, thank you very much. Oh, Bryce, sorry. I, I was wondering if this is an, an area where um, the federal definition of rural is a disadvantage to California. And, um, and, and is there any chance, I mean, if we go into Farm Bill, if we, okay, very good, just um, talk to some of our, our representatives and they just say, good luck with that, we just, we're never going to get there with that, but very good. I, I'm just curious if there's a map that shows where we have coverage and where we don't. Is that, Martha, you're going to answer that? Excellent. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that was, I, had the, I had the same question, too, but we'll, we'll move on to our next speaker, and maybe we'll get all of our questions answered today. We, right. <laughs> Thank you again, Robert. Well, next up uh, on rural broadband uh, perspective is Greg Norton with the Rural County Representatives of California. Greg is the president, uh, CEO of the Rural, Rural County Representatives of California, RCRC, a 34-member county-strong service organization advocating on behalf of California's rural counties. Greg is, responsibility for the, uh, is responsible for the overall operations of organization, organizations, including the oversight of the affiliate entities, the Golden State Finance Authority, GSFA, and the National Home Buyers Fund, Incorporated, NHF. Greg has been uh, with the organization for nearly 15 years, serving in his current role since 2006. So welcome, Greg. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. And I want to extend my gratitude to the whole board for the opportunity to be able to share with you this morning. And um, particular, if I could, uh, um, to acknowledge um, Secretary Ross for all the um, time that she spent and the efforts that she's done on behalf of RCRC and the state as a whole. Um, she's been a great champion for us and we really appreciate all that she's done. Um, also, thank you, Josh, for arranging today and coordinating with us to be able to be here. Thank you. Um, you know, among other efforts, it's been, you, you touched a little bit on um, uh, some of the things we're doing at the federal level and we do have staff there today. Um, and we are advocating with a number of the, our, the federal entities and, and agencies on the Farm Bill at the FCC. In particular, we're working closely with um, Director Kim Van in her rural no, new role as Director of Rural Development in California um, and meeting with a number of congressional offices on, on matters that are there, including um, California getting its share in the way that things are um, distributed in regard to counties and census tracts and, and things of that nature in the Farm Bill. So we have advocated on those issues for some time and, and are continuing to do so. Um, also, as was noted in uh, the introduction, um, we represent um, 35 counties in California, um, RCRC does, on federal and state advocacy-related matters. 
Uh, we also do operate um, other entities on behalf of those. All of our board members are elected county supervisors. And I can tell you that we really do have an incredible board of members that genuinely care about the communities that they serve in, uh, which makes my job and our job much easier um, th with the dedication that they have to their communities and the commitment that they put in to the larger group as a whole. Um, we do operate a couple of other entities on behalf of the rural counties. Um, two of those provide um, primarily capital finance in a variety of areas, including single family down payment assistance, um, multifamily development renovation, energy efficiency, renewable energy, water conservation uh, programs, et cetera. We also are in the process now of um, undergoing a significant inventory and development of uh, new financing tools for rural infrastructure, water, wastewater, um, sewer roads and bridges, community facilities, and including rural broadband. Um, our entities have participated in financing more than $20 billion in capital, including providing for assistance to more than 113,000 families to buy a home um, and 30,000 uh, projects for uh, energy efficiency and water conservation, as well as other projects that we work on. I share that with you briefly just to give you a little bit of flavor of some of the other things that we do beyond what we're more commonly associated with on, on the rural advocacy, which is obviously our most important role for our members. Um, and I'm going to refer back to those briefly um, later in my discussion. Um, RCRC's position is that high-speed broadband must be considered an important and necessary, necessary piece of the county's infrastructure. Uh, just like the efficient and, and reliable roadways, public safety resources, um, electricity, water, sanitation, and all the other things that we've referred to here earlier in the discussion. Further, it's imperative for us that this broadband, and we, you previously were discussing the speeds, um, one of the things that I've been saying more frequently is that the speed of broadband that we implement in these communities and throughout the state need to no longer be considered at the speed of the customer. They must be considered to be at the speed of commerce. Um, we have a lot of things that are occurring, and even when some of the minimum standards are currently met uh, and achieved in some of the implementation, they do not provide for the support that is necessary for small businesses, um, ranchers and farmers, and others that are trying to compete and let alone attract new industry to our communities that can be helpful. Um, while something's better than nothing, um, I, I would agree with that. It's our position that the current generally accepted um, definition for served does not in any way meet what is basically needed for economic development and some of the other services that are necessary for these communities to thrive. Uh, as you're aware, broadband infrastructure is a critical issue for rural communities throughout the state and the country. Um, I've heard countless times from my members how difficult it is for some of the services they provide to be performed. I'll share a couple of those examples with you. Um, the lack of uh, broadband services in a lot of these rural and remote areas um, creates quite a disadvantage. Um, according to the 2016 report by the CPUC, only 43% of rural population um, has access in high, to high-speed broadband. Um, we represent a substantial part of California's geography, and it's much of that geography that is currently un or underserved. I know that you're aware of these impacts as much as I am. Um, we're concerned not only with just what our current situation is, but with the long-term implications um, and the current lack of uh, adequate service and the planning as we move forward. Um, it's our view that uh, we need to not only think about what is required today, but we do need to think far ahead. And some of the discussions that you were, again, were having about speed, and I was talking about the speed of commerce, um, we think that we need to put in, at a minimum, one gigabyte systems um, so that these, uh, the future needs can be met. With all that we have coming in artificial intelligence and automation and the digital economy, uh, if we put in uh, just 100 megabytes at this time, we're going to be uh, behind again in a short period. Um, the disparity that currently exists in rural communities um, creates a myriad of challenges, and already these populations are facing so much throughout the state. Um, it, in one of the terms that we've been using is that there are digital deserts um, in the communities that we serve, um, and it just creates additional inequities like the limit, limiting the opportunity for economic development, inability of farmers and small businesses to reach potential markets. Some cannot even create a robust website. Uh, it limits the sales opportunities and the ability to expand and, and to export products that might be uh, viable in export markets. Inability to timely process credit card transactions. Um, the online purchases and things of that nature that can help a small business survive and be able to hire more employees, creating more jobs. 
um, let alone those things, they, they aren't able to um, access what others commonly access in regard to research and development trends, business tools, providing for employee education and training, and so much more. Um, again, not to mention an inability to attract new business and industry to their communities because that basic service is not available. Uh, in addition to the economic development and other related opportunities, many more areas, and I, I don't want to belabor all this, but there's so many more areas that are negatively impacted. I'd just like to touch on it for a moment. I know none of these would be new to you, but still I feel it's important for me to state them. Um, educational opportunities, the, the um, inequality in California and the rural areas uh, means that a number of our students can't participate in the technology-driven world. Um, one of the things that is um, being currently referred to is the homework gap, where students cannot get homework done at home without the service there. They may be able to go to their library or their school or a McDonald's that has wireless, but if they want to do their homework at home, many in the rural communities are unable to do so. Um, rural broadband improvements would allow them to access the world-class education and the other opportunities that are available to so many others with this distance learning and some of the other opportunities that we're pursuing here. Also, public safety is drastically impacted, and that's been touched on uh, to give first responders enhanced tools to save lives at the same time and to be able to get to where they need to uh, more timely and understand what is occurring there before the first responders even uh, arrive. Uh, would also provide for improved management of critical infrastructure um, with water and wastewater treatment, even managing water conservation in the watersheds and things of that nature. The enhanced technology could really benefit the state as a whole to have these existing in rural areas. Um, and not to touch on a lot of the things that, that could be benefited to local governments and the services they provide. Um, further, in an area that I know you're much more keenly aware of than I am, uh, we're all aware of what's occurring in a lot of the um, opportunities for precision ag and ag technology and the benefits that could significantly enhance the, the, uh, the outputs and water conservation and the, the soils and so many other things that could be beneficial. Another area that um, sometimes is not thought about but is a huge economic area for our communities in particular, the state as a whole, is rural tourism. Um, California's parks and, and natural amenities are visited by millions of people. Um, broadband is often cited as a vital service for the visitors that they'd like to have. Um, we, we heard from, we, we speak with so many folks in the rural areas and we learned from Volcano Telecommunications. They shared with us that they had the ability to install a wireless system in a national park and were able to actually support and measure increased visitors, extended stays in the national forest areas and so on because of the recently increased broadband access. People are more comfortable, they can stay connected as we, so many of us want to in our current days and um, that provided that opportunity. Further, it provides for additional public safety considerations for residents and tourists throughout rural California and the state as they can have more timely access to emergency medical assistance if it's needed. Um, one, one thing that I found interesting, I heard from our former chair, John Viegas, that in Glen County, um, some of the areas that they patrol and their sheriffs, they have no connection. They actually drive to a resident and go to their landline to make a call back to the station to tell them that there's something that has occurred and they need assistance for. That just doesn't seem like that should be possible in California, but it does exist. Um, healthcare opportunities are also limited, though previously Robert touched on uh, rural telehealth and, and areas that we can benefit from. Um, one example that I can give you that's a direct application is that a number of our counties in the county jails, um, they have mandates and requirements, let alone when somebody is injured or sick, to take inmates for certain treatments. Um, currently what they do is they take two sheriffs off the street, they transport the inmate many times very long distances to a hospital or a clinic. These two sheriffs are now not on the streets in the county and patrolling as they would be because now they're with this inmate for a long trip, 60, 80, 100 miles uh, to the facility and then driving them back. Um, broad, high speed broadband and with some of the technology that's currently available, I've, I've had the opportunity to observe it, observe it in action myself, can provide for most of these facilities and services to occur within the jail. Uh, providing not just saving time for the sheriff and getting them back on the streets and not just saving um, time and money, but also providing the inmates with better care. So these are other things that we need to have happen in our communities. Um, based on the data, you know, it's clear that broadband investment in, in rural and remote uh, areas has lacked significantly. Um, many of these uh, communities have been devastated already by natural resource loss. 
And so th this not having this resource as well creates additional difficulties. So just basically, um, I should say that Josh helped with outlining uh, for me, suggested outline of things I should touch on. And so I'm trying to do that. I'm sorry if I'm a little redundant to some of the things you've already heard. But one of the things he asked is, how did we get here? Um, rural broadband projects, as we all know, often don't pencil out. Um, as I previously alluded to in California, many of the cases that are they're, um, significantly lag in the investment in, in broadband. Um, the, so much infrastructure as a whole with broadband, in my mind, front and center, that has been lacking. Clearly, the economics are a challenge. Uh, there's fewer users to pay for it. There's greater distances that must be reached. Um, there's other challenges associated with um, the adoption rates in, in those areas are historically low. So you already have fewer users and you're not getting the same adoption rates. All those create some problems on revenue streams and financing. Permitting and mitigation costs are another challenge. Um, it, it's not only the infrastructure and the, the equipment, but the regulations and the permitting that has to be gone through is quite expensive. Um, it was asked a few moments ago, where does the money go? Um, in the Digital 395 project that was referenced in Yonono counties, the project cost $106 million, with the permitting and mitigation costs exceeding $24 million of that 106. Further, the project took longer to permit than it took to actually build it out. And so there's got to be some things that we can do there that would benefit our efforts and decrease the cost and make it more feasible to achieve implementation. Um, we all know also that California has unique landscape and terrain issues that pose challenges. So those are the things that create some of the difficulties we have. Also think that in some cases, and not with you obviously with this hearing you're having today, there's a lack of awareness and, and will, I think, to achieve some of this. Um, those that work and live in rural communities, obviously there's a, an acute awareness of the digital deserts that they live in, but many in the urban and suburban communities that have good service may not recognize that that exists in other parts of the state. And in fact, some of them are very disappointed when they visit those parts of the state. Um, I live in suburban Placer County. I have a lot of choices and, and it's easy for me to get service, but a short drive from where I live, um, I might be lucky to find one provider and in fact, one of our employees who lives in Placer County as well, outside of Auburn, um, he can see our office building, he can see the state capitol from his home, but he has limited service from one small provider. As he tells, uh, tells it, once his kids are on their devices or if a storm goes through, connectivity is slowed if available at all. Um, in other words, he can see the capital of the highest technology state in the nation, but he can't get service at his house. Um, even if he tries to watch Netflix, it gets interrupted. So we do believe that there are options and opportunities, though, however, for us to start closing the digital divide um, in our rural communities. Um, infrastructure investment is one of the key issues and it, it does have bipartisan support. Uh, so we're thankful that that's part of what's being worked on. Um, in fact, I, again, you guys hosting this meeting is encouraging to me that with the awareness that you're raising to this issue. Um, but so long as the constituencies remain in the dark, we'll continue to struggle to get this resolved. So we must champion policies and, and support opportunities to expedite build. Um, some of the things I've already talked on, um, talked to, um, I think that the uh, ubiquitous broadband deployment is a critical and it must be a high priority throughout the state. It provides opportunity to rebuild struggling communities, which does benefit the state as a whole. Um, you know, was, has already been referred to with the Railroad Act and rural electrification and the telephone service and the Highway Act and those that have been in the past, we view this as a similar challenge and issue that must be taken on to get the infrastructure in place that's needed. Dig once policies have a common sense element to them, although I know there's struggles with being able to achieve that at times. Um, we should look at streamlined permitting, um, dedicated subject matters and, and lead entities and agencies all these things to help us to avoid some of the uh, examples, some of the delays that I expressed through uh, 395 that they faced in additional time and, and uh, cost. In regard to financing projects, I mentioned to you before that our organization has been involved in quite a lot of capital finance. We're currently exploring additional and innovative financing structures to support rural broadband deployment specifically. Uh, with fewer government dollars available, uh, and more costly and lower revenue yielding um, broadband projects that we're trying to achieve, innovative financing me mechanisms and tools must be developed. We're exploring pursuing uh, public-private partnerships as an option. We've actively engaged when seeking those opportunities. 
Uh, we've been in uh, contact with private investment organizations. Uh, we also need, though, to have some of the low-cost loans and some of the um, subsidy of uh, guarantee programs to help make the private capital more affordable. Um, these programs help to reduce the risk in the private capital investment and encourage more activity <clears throat> with the larger institutional investors. And thankfully right now, because of where we are headed in our society in this digital economy that we're in, there are more of the large institutional investors interested in implementing broadband backbone in areas because they're taking a long-term view and not just a current need view. Um, we need to explore the use of tax incentives, um, accelerated write-offs. I mean, if you think about it like a, a, a farmer, he plants an orchard and it takes five or six years before he starts bearing fruit. That's the same as a lot of the rural broadband projects. 395 is experiencing this. It'll take five or six years in many cases before they become profitable. So if in that period there can be tax incentives for accelerated write-off or um, deferral of property tax or things of that nature, then that period where there's not the amount of revenues that can sustain it, there's other opportunities to make it more affordable and, and more reasonable. Um, there's, there's so many things that, that need to be occurring, in it. and one of the things I want to um, restate is that we are pursuing, in the efforts that we're talking about and then we talk with others, we're discussing um, gigabyte uh, systems, um, which means that we are supportive of the Gigabyte Opportunity Zone Act that's currently going through at the federal government. Uh, that can enhance some of the opportunities that we already have in opportunity zones, uh, many of which exist in some of these areas that we're discussing. So in conclusion, regardless of where you reside, rural, urban, um, suburban, the markets are all connected. We live in a digital and rapidly growing um, economy. Um, we're, RCRC as a whole, we're agnostic in regard to the technology that may be utilized. I know that a lot of alternatives exist in, in Wi-Fi and other technologies that can um, saturate markets. But none of those still exist without being able to reconnect somewhere to the backbone and the fiber. So it's important that we recognize it still must connect back to the fiber, and we need to install those for these other opportunities and other technologies to have value. Um, some of that technology <clears throat> in its current form is, is, is even limited in the current and existing and where we're headed in the digital economy. I know that those things will catch up. I'm amazed by the pace of how innovation works. But right now, there's a lot of things that, that we can't do. With artificial intelligence, automation, quantum computing, digital currencies, the gig economy, smart cities and regions, uh, Internet of Things, all these things that are on our plate right now to be uh, achieved, it's not going to be achieved without having a, a substantive and robust uh, gigabyte systems out there that can grow with the future. So we need to be prepared to um, compete in that world in the new economy. And I think that it's most important that we do what we do now, the decisions that we make are made with a long-term view of increased broadband speeds that exceed what is needed today to help meet what will be needed tomorrow so we can improve our economies, create more jobs, enhance health care treatment and public safety, um, have fewer families that are on need of assistance and provide better service for those that do need assistance, um, higher yields from agriculture, water conservation, expanded markets for business so they can reach other markets and export, and so much more. Um, I'm glad and thank you again for the opportunity to share these things with you today. Um, it is an area that is a priority for us that we're spending quite a lot of our time and efforts on, and with that, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate your, your uh, presentation today. I mean, I, you guys have heard me complain many, many times about our situation where we used to have a landline, but then the company wouldn't repair the landline um, because, of, and they wouldn't replace it because it was too expensive to do, and force us to go to voice over internet for our phones with two megabytes of, of service uh, and less than that on uh, on uploads. To where you know it, it turns into a safety issue for ourselves and our employees. Uh, we can't adapt uh, new technology. And our self-service doesn't work on part of our area as well. So we're, uh, we're hopeful that there's some solutions coming. So we'll open it up for other questions. Joy. Joy. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation and for all that you do as an org organization. I am an avid reader of the barbed wire. I recommend it. If anybody isn't getting it, get it, because it's really fantastic. It keeps you up to date. I'm a little confused. You mentioned one area 
what had it was costing a hundred million dollars and the entire state of New York was a billion so I don't see how that adds up I don't know how to correlate that to um, what New York did I don't know what um, their system details and technology utilized were but on the 395 project um, that was done utilizing predominantly ARA funds the total project cost was 106 million granted those are a lot of miles um, down 395 through Inyo and Mono counties, so it's long distance. It cost $106 million, and the thing I was referring to most significantly was that $24 million of that was the cost of the permitting and regulatory process. Thank you for your presentation. I'm going to take advantage of you to ask a very elementary question, which is when you said uh, that everything had to connect back to the fiber, I'm not clear about what, why wireless is not. Well, wireless, wireless. is a great solution and, and probably is the solution for a lot of the last mile delivery. Um, and I'm speaking to you not as an expert in, in technology, but what I've learned in the discussions that I've had with uh, developers and others that are involved in the industry is that you, we need to have robust fiber networks that connect to the towers that link to the wireless servers and, and to drones that provide wireless um, networks and all that. Otherwise, we have less chance for line of sight and we have slower networks. So I don't, that's probably not the full technical answer to that, but that is as I understand it. Don? Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, being from a rural area, um, Broadband uh, is not the only infrastructure issue we have, uh, as you know. I do. And, um, and the problem is you don't have a population base that can pay for broadband, clean drinking water, um, and, and it goes on and on, roads, what have you. And, and so, um, and if you go to a loan program, you can't, for you know, like our little community can't afford to build a water treatment facility up to the standards that the state requires, and so we're always in default. And you know, unless there's some sort of grant program or just direct appropriations uh, to get some of this basic infrastructure built, um, it's not going to happen. Um, and and so, what? How how does how does our CRC approach this? Because a grant type program is probably counter to what a lot of the members would would support, but without those types of programs, um, I, I find it difficult. You can't. You couldn't afford to pay for the service. I think. So can can you talk a little bit about how, Happy how to. You, you're doing that? Um, um, yes, we're we're. I'm acutely aware of just what you're talking about, and um, started back uh, some years ago on how we might be able to help with finance on one wastewater treatment facility, et cetera. And you're right, on its own, it's not feasible. They don't have the users and the amount of costs associated with it with some of the other even resources that are available, it's not sufficient. We are in the process and many of the programs that we do, um, we develop them based on the oversimplified economy of scale. And so right now we have out a survey for um, infrastructure needs throughout our 35 member counties, water, wastewater, sewer treatment, community facilities, broadband, um, roads and bridges, et cetera. Um, in a short period, we've received 180 responses and it's still growing. What we intend to do is to take many of the projects that have similarities and pool them into an investment pools that can together have a better opportunity than a standalone because many of the investors that would invest in these opportunities now, they don't want to write checks for 10 and $12 million. They almost don't want to write checks for $250 million. They're more interested in large opportunities where it would be a public-private partnership, which I know is going to take some adjusting to and, and people getting used to, but it's a potential opportunity for us to be able to get many of these small projects that on their own will not be able to be achieved to be completed. Uh, we're working with a number of groups and organizations, including um, large philanthropic organizations that are interested in this arena, and not just through direct contribution, but through contribution toward building a long-term um, infrastructure, including uh, the labor side of it and things of that nature. So we're taking a new look at it and trying to figure out ways that we can provide for more affordable financing so that 
one small pocket of users on their own, um, basically they're not bearing the burdens of all of it, though we all know it's needed. The other thing, is the way I look at it, is the those infrastructure items that you talked about, broadband, transportation, all of those are needed in all these communities for these communities to have the opportunity to then grow again and for their economies to, to thrive. And so there are other savings that we can be achieved that we don't really recognize when we talk about the individual issue, but when those opportunities are provided, more people can get jobs, fewer people are off of assistance, um, more uh, attracting, more attraction of other opportunities and businesses and the people that can live there that help those, econ those communities grow. And I know a lot of those communities, they don't want to grow into big urban communities, but they still have to have the basic infrastructure in place to be able to support themselves and to be able to have a reasonable amount of growth for their economy. Um, one, one other question. You mentioned that 43% uh, of the rural areas have access to, to high-speed broadband. What was that 10 years ago? I'm just curious. No, that was um, in the CPUC report in 2015 or 16. I'm just curious what, what it was 10 years ago. I mean, oh, I you know, in I, terms of looking at a good at question. I, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that okay. off the top of my head. Very good. Really appreciate your uh, your information today. Great. Thank you for thank your you. time and thank you for spending your day here listening to these important issues. Yep. It's important. I, it's important I, to the state. Yeah. I just want to add there's not a lot of voices for rural California, so thank you for what you guys do on a yes. daily basis. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, we're going to shift a little bit with uh, the California Public Utilities Commission. We have uh, Commissioner Martha Guzman Aceves. Uh, joining us today, and uh, also uh, Robert Wollerjohn. Uh, Martha was appointed commissioner at this. Pardon? Martha was uh, appointed commissioner at the CPUC by Governor Brown on December 28, 2016. She previously served as De uh, Deputy Legislative Affairs Secretary with the Office of the Governor since 2011 focusing on natural resources, environmental protection, energy, and food and agriculture. Way to go. She was Sustainable Communities Program Director for the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation from 2005 to 2011. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see you all again. I miss you. <laughs> all those uh, pests and... Um, but I'm very excited about the kiwi, or not the kiwi, the seaweed. <laughs> very different, the seaweed. Last week when some of the research from UC Davis about what the potential for seaweed added to the cow's diet could do on methane reduction, I get a one-line text from Martha that says, all this time we could have been feeding them sushi. <laughs> of course, the California cows are eating sushi. Uh, it is really nice to be here, and I just wanted to um, say how much I agree with all the comments that have been made, and, um, you know, I wish that we did have a, a master plan in California uh, about the deployment of this infrastructure, uh, but it is constantly changing, and I also just want to be clear that, unfortunately, we have no jurisdiction over requiring anything here. <laughs> um, however... However, there will probably be some uh, discussion on the need to provide more guidance around the needs next year again, because there will be a bill that is sunsetting. Uh, and that bill said, PUC, you're going to have no jurisdiction over broadband, uh, and that bill's up uh, very soon. So, um, so I think um, we have learned in this era of, you know, as uh, Mr. Cameron said, of transitioning from copper and um, competition doesn't solve it all, especially when there are areas that don't have competition. So we have to kind of prepare. But in the meantime, we do have a grant program that I do want to really spend the time talking to you about. And, and uh, really one of the elements that we're trying to do with this new program, this renewed program, is engage the carrier community some that I want to acknowledge did come today. We have Eric from AT&T, and we also have Frontier, and I don't know if anybody else here, but those are two major players in our rural communities that I, I'm, 
I want to continue to partner with them and we're gonna get into details of how that may happen. And also wanna acknowledge uh, Joy's leadership in, in trying to make more progress quickly. Okay, so this, um, you guys all have copies, I believe of this, right? How does this work? <laughs> Josh, oh, oh, there we go. That is so backwards, okay. Uh, all right, so as you'll see here, um, this program already existed, and last year, the legislature reauthorized it. So we have a couple of buckets. The biggest bucket is the infrastructure grant bucket. And we'll have uh, three years to uh, spend the money. And we have, like many of our programs, we have a little extra time to fully spend it. Um, and um, so this, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> there, there's, uh, on the right, there's a little um, column here that talks about some of the major changes in the program. 300 million in the infrastructure grant account. Um, we have, previously we used to have loans, we're getting rid of the loans. And we have what's called a consortia account. I don't know, do you guys already know, familiar with that? But no, okay, so real briefly, these are local governments, local NGOs, local businesses, and they have formed into what, um, uh, they call consortias, and they've received funding from carriers, from settlements, from foundations, from businesses, and they try to build the partnerships to get more infrastructure built out in their communities. So this year, the legislature included funding to give them more capacity. It's only a small amount. And finally, we have the adoption account, which is also a new bucket, and this is more not, this is actually a urban-rural issue. So one of the issues, as we heard, um, and the uh, previous gentleman from RCRC on the rule, on some of the 395 build out, but we don't have the adoption levels that we need yet. Some people don't even know it's there. Some people um, you know, need to know the value of it. So there's that kind of adoption to really get people aware. And then there's really urban based adoption where there's a real, uh, not surprisingly, unfortunately, discrepancy in lower income communities of color. And what are we doing about getting adoption levels higher there? The infrastructure is available there. So that's that pot of money. Okay, so let me move on here. There's a lot of slides, so I'm gonna talk quickly and Rob's gonna get into more of the details. This is the revised goals of the legislation, the Internet uh, for All Act Now, um, that no surprise was championed by many of the rural members, uh, bipartisan measure. 98% of households um, in each consortia region. So previously the goal was statewide. And of course, when you go statewide, you miss the communities in each region. And this will be, this is a better goal for rural California because it gets at those pockets. Um, this is, the second point is a really important component. The federal government through the FCC has a Connect America Fund. And that is essentially another set of grant funding that has gone to what we call the incumbent carriers. So AT&T, Frontier that are here, the main players there. And they have certain uh, goals that they have to meet on building out to unserved areas. And the legislature said, don't build in those same areas. You know, work with the carriers. If the carriers were gonna build 90% uh, out of the community, maybe fill in the last 10%. Or don't even go to that community, go to another community that they're not going for. And um, hopefully soon we'll be able to show, show some success of that because uh, one particular carrier frontier has already put in applications to try to do that. And that's a very positive thing and that's a new thing where that collaboration wasn't there in the past. And of course, as was said already, we are technology neutral, um, which is also a very uh, important part because uh, as you'll, you'll probably hear from AT&T, their, their technology is a largely uh, model of what they call closed loop wireless system. Some of our traditional funding, like the 395, was just fiber, fiber to the home and very much uh, expensive. So we, we need all the options. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to Rob. Uh, oh, you have your own mic. Sure, sure. that <laughs> way you, you, can, you can talk as well if you wanna add, please do. Um, so um, where the commissioner is our vision and for, for this program and the, and the proceeding to implement the new legislation and, and is providing guide, guiding uh, uh, leadership to the staff, I represent the, the staff that implements the program, so I'm the rubber that meets the road. 
And so the successes and failures of the program, I'd like to kind of highlight for you some of the issues that, 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 that are criteria that affect how we do our job. And, and so looking at this interactive broadband map, when you have a program that uh, is going to give money away, you have to determine eligibility. And what we do is we have an interactive map. It's called the state broadband map. If you search it, you'll find it. It's interactive. That means you can click an address on there and find out, is broadband available? So essentially, the problem we have is, is determining, is broadband available? And it's fraught with a lot of different um, uh, uh, problems. First of all, we have this, we, we determine on this map what is green is served, so that's ineligible. What we use, they would call this the stoplight or eligibility map. What is yellow is unserved or slow service, and what is red is unserved where there's no service or just dial up, right? And so if you go and look at that map again, you'll see Sacramento is largely served with broadband above 6-1 speed. And there are areas in red that are unserved with absolutely uh, no service available or it's broadband, uh, I, or it's dial-up, excuse me. And then yellow is kind of, there's some service there. So um, then getting to uh, the next map, this kind of shows a larger part of California. And this is a snapshot of our interactive map where there's a key on the right-hand side and you can click uh, buttons to see and open up windows and you can select things. This shows like California, there's a lot of it that is red, uh, parts of it is yellow, and the part that is white is where there's no households. Now this program is designed primarily to get broadband to households, so we use census blocks to make that determination. John, Do you have a question? Quick question. So. On the 6-1 speed, is that the FCC standard, or is that a California standard? That is not standard? the FCC standard. It's a California standard. So the FCC standards vary depending on what you're talking about. They have a 4-1 standard. They have a, a definition of broadband, which is around 756 kilobytes or something like that. So they track broadband at various speeds. But I'll just mention something as an aside. It is true California is behind New York. For example, California has got about 95% broadband to households available at 25.3, where New York is at 98%, right? So we are behind. Um, but if you look at other measures, so the other FCC measure of this 5-1, uh, because they have a 5-1 that they track as well, both California and New York are even. We're both at 99.9 percent .9 have broadband at that speed within that range. I Go just ahead. have a really big, I don't get what 6-1 is, sorry. Oh, excuse me, let me define that for you. We talk about uh, download speeds and upload speeds. So 25.3 is 25 megabytes downstream and 3 megabits upstream. So anyone who's putting fiber to the home you can pretty much get gigabit speeds downstream and upstream, and it's a really about the electronics that, that define what you get at that point. But a lot of these old telephone networks that, that, that exist for a long time have copper wires between a central office and the home, if you think about telephone networks, and those are constrained. And that's the problem of rural California. In these areas that are yellow, typically, you have something like slow DSL that has not been upgraded to beyond six megabits down and, and one megabit upstream. So those networks are really constrained. It is a real rural problem. So uh, going on, if I can get through this quick. Oh, yes, you have a question. Yes. I, this is not so much a question, but I just would love to state that the 6-1, which is the California standard, is new because of a bill that it what became legislation, became law, January 1, and that is the Internet for All Act. So Correct. our sta the California standard used to be higher. That's number one. So we've, we've gone backwards in that regard. And number two, the current FCC standard, although there may be other metrics, the 6-1, the, the I would argue, is inadequate for all of the programs that we have already discussed today that need to be implemented statewide. So Absolutely. just as a point of clarification, 6-1, while that is what is the law, 
to me is simply not acceptable. Sure, and I just want to clarify, just thank you, Joy, for raising that, because some of the discussion the legislature had was how do we prioritize the most unserved? So I wouldn't, even though it's, you know, so for instance, Assemblymember Dolly up in, you know, northeastern part of the state here has like one, it was like one down, one up, like, the, you know, nothing. And I think that was the right policy in the end to prioritize the most unserved, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna be funding that. We're, we're trying to go beyond that, and we have to go at least 10 down, one up, but that's still insufficient. I completely agree. Um, but I do think that we do need to get to a point where we're saying as, a, as California, we have this ongoing standard that we need to continuously update. So I would not look at it as much as the California standard, as much as the prioritization of the funding. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, I have another question about clarification. Earlier we were talking about 100 MPBS. How does that relate to 6-1? I think that was the New York standard. Yes, 6% six, six of 100 is 6-1, is 6 down. So it, it, is, it is pretty low. So, um, but subject to check, we need to find out is what it, New York is actually doing. So, for example, um, are they really connecting uh, uh, fiber to every household? And it, or are they providing middle mile and backbone services to regions that are unserved? But that's a, that's a problem, just like New York has a similar problem as California. There's rural areas and there's insufficient infrastructure serving them, and that's what we're trying to do. But let me just touch on one thing here that makes it difficult for us to determine eligibility for this program, because it's critical. It's the issue of how do we deal with tertiary or that old landline service compared to fixed wireless and also mobile services. Do those count against eligibility? So, for example, with fixed wireless here, you can see that Central California here, and this is a terminology that the staff created, we call this partially served. These are areas where fixed wireless providers exist. And you may know some fixed wireless providers yourselves if you live in rural areas. There, there are people you may know who may be uh, colleagues or, or, or acquaintances. Um, if we are not to count these fixed wireless providers as being served, then we put a project in there, we put them out of business. And that becomes an issue too, is that there's winners and losers for whenever we go into these areas because often what we find is that that when we do a grant to a rural area, there's often some kind of provider there. And is it enough service to qualify? Now, often people are dissatisfied. They don't like the, the, the periodic 12-1 down to 3-1 down to 2-1. It's, 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 it's variable depending on how many people on their network. So then we get into an issue. Then are we overbuilding or do we just want the fixed wireless provider to come in and do a grant? And then the fixed wireless provider comes in and then there's other fixed wireless providers who are now being put out of business because we gave a grant to that one. So it becomes a real issue for us and we're trying to deal with this by doing better data analytics. And we have something called the California CalSpeed app that for which we can get public feedback and we can get detail on the data. So I, I'll mention about that in a second. So we have wireline, we have fixed wireless, and then, excuse me, I'm pushing the wrong button. And then we have mobile. We have the sim similar problem. This is California. You can see, I think that's, is that Tulare there? And, and Tulare, and uh, you can see a lot of it is served by this mobile data above 6.1. A lot of it is underserved. That means there's some service and some areas where there's no mobile service available at all. Should mobile count? It's also a question. And it's being considered by the commission in, in its existing proceeding about how much should we treat our uh, mobile services as being adequate for um, broadband. And so it's something to deal with in order to determine eligibility. So if I get into a question. I had a question. I think you're overly generous in your map to begin with. And, and, <laughs> and 
you know, I'm looking at this map, and you, you may have coverage, but you may have one, if you're with one carrier and you go across the street and you lose service, and maybe another carrier has better service there. I mean, but, you know, we're not with multiple carriers, uh, right. for one thing, and and even with multiple carriers, there's areas that are complete, completely in the dark. <coughs> That's so. absolutely true, yes. And, and I would say not just on the on the mobile, but I think unfortunately the information on all the maps is questionable. And I know there's a mechanism for individuals to please, please, please go on the CPUC website, input your own speed so that it can be rectified. But the maps themselves, as we look at them, are and I, when was the last time the maps were updated? Just out of uh, this map is as of. December 31st, uh, 2016, the new data for the end of the year 2017 is forthcoming. Although the mobile data represents uh, um, the fall of 2017, we actually have people that go and, and do uh, two, uh, nearly 2,000 test points in California every, uh, every year, and we measure and then interpolate this data. It's pretty accurate because people go back out and do tests, and it comes back showing that there is a provider. But then again, the, the is should mobile count? It, it really is an issue we need to resolve because otherwise areas sh are not eligible for the program. And I'd like to show you something about th this lower chart here on this first graph shows you a little bit about the disparity in California of, of households having broadband available. Those uh, acronyms down there, I'll expel some out. For example, the first one is the Broadband Consortium of the Pacific Coast. Uh, they're around 90, over 95 percent uh, served. But if you get to this three over is the Central Sierra Connect Consortium, CSCC, they're way down by about 77 percent. If we want to look at a large farming interest area, that would be um, uh, the, uh, excuse me, let me find it, the San Joaquin Valley Regional Broadband Consortium, that's SJVRBC, it's third from the right. You can see that uh, there is served is fairly high, but it's still about 93%. Um, but you know that there's areas that are unserved. And this consortium is, is there to represent some of the interest to help to get broadband to those areas. So as I was speaking about this program, and, and, and Commissioner was speaking to the monies available, the 300 million, that's primarily designed to go after providing service to households. So for example, the digital 395 that was funded 80% by the ERA grant, 18% by CASF program for a total of 98% funding for that middle mile. We call it middle mile. It was really a backbone network on the Eastern Sierra. That did not connect anyone, actually, any households. What it did is it provided a backbone for other providers to. And so if you look at that network, it only has less than 200 customers. But those customers are serving end user households and businesses. So it's critical to, to see the importance of middle mile when a region doesn't have it adequate facilities. This program can do both. It provides it to the households and it provides it for when the middle mile portion is necessary, but they have to be linked. But there's another aspect of this program that might be interest to you and your constituents, and that is when the commissioner mentioned the infrastructure grant account of 300 million, there is a $5 million included. It's kind of a pilot for a line extension program. The line extension program differs in that it, it doesn't have to be just to households. It can be to any location needing broadband. And that can, to that, so the applicant is the property owner, and uh, although this program has not been implemented yet, the uh, commissioner's proceeding will adopt rules on, to guide my staff on how to implement it. That program will allow, for example, some innovative uh, solutions. So for example, if you have that dairy farm in an area that has no broadband, the property owner could apply for a line extension to an existing provider to bring broadband service to that location. 
I also am aware that a lot of the broadband needs, and now I'm not a farmer and I don't know the technology, haven't studied it, but I, what my staff talks about as, you know, broadband to the head of lettuce, is that there needs to be some kind of connectivity in these areas where there's no households. But our program doesn't solve that except for maybe the line extension. There needs to be something where there's innovation from another party to think about providing perhaps Wi-Fi network or fixed wireless to serve that farmland area, perhaps using the line extension. It's not something we're designing, but we would expect that the innovation would come through people who want to advocate for, through this, per, perhaps through the regional consortium. And the regional consortium is their job, partly, to bring those applications to the commission, to represent the community and their interests. And the regional consortium, through talking about the demand aggregation, who needs what in my community, and then talking with the providers and, and, and figuring out, well, the commission's program says this, this, and this. How about doing an application? When my staff gets that application, we respond to it. But we're not the ones that go out and do a needs assessment. That's the job, and specifically the 20 million, or the 10 million for us, the consortia to do. So we haven't resolved that. And, and they're taking comment on that once we, with staff has put out some proposed rules on this, and I don't recall that we had a limit on it. Uh, but uh, there's comments that have been filed by the public, and some have said a very short limit, and some others have said longer. So, but I'd be, you know, it's something that the commission is, has not ruled on yet. Oh, average cost per mile. I mean, arguably, the whole pot is very small. We did an estimate of how much it would cost to bring fiber to every household in California, and it's roughly between four and six billion dollars. I don't know how New York can do it for one, but. I also wanted to share in, in going out and doing our workshops, we've learned a lot, and there are some leaders in rural California, Kings County, interestingly enough, the school district there, and Imperial County, the Imperial uh, County School District. Both of them are using their ed, what's called their education spectrum, and they're not, instead of leasing it, the county is uh, basically letting the school district administer it. Most of them, as an example, uh, lease it to Sprint. That's the main company that the education spectrum is leased to. And these two counties have decided to build out their own infrastructure. And a large part of Governor Brown's initiative over the last few years has been to get every student to have access to broadband. And they're trying to link the school access to the home. And really, we're kind of watching Imperial because they're taking a big lead on it. But there's places like Kettleman City of all places, that's really leading and trying to provide it to the home. And some of it has to do with the advantage of being very flat in some of these areas, certainly Imperial, and basically having like this backbone of fiber around the entire area and using fixed wireless to connect it all the way through. It's really impressive and we'll see how they are able to continue to work with um, the carriers in the community, as Rob mentioned, there's still a role for the carriers in, in a lot of the non-educational use. But there are some, some real big thinkers out there in, in rural California. And I just wanted to highlight that the education districts are some of the, the leading thinkers on it. But those are, those are yes. But those are workarounds, and um, you know, and and that seems unfortunate. That what we're um, suggesting is that the best way to achieve the goal is to work around the system, and that seems most 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 unfortunate to me. Um, I'd be curious about the timeline. You know, the 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 workshops have taken place. The consortium have submitted 
um, their priorities. So what what is what is happening and and when? Okay, thank you. Well, one thing I. I don't necessarily think the Imperial and, and King's model are, are workarounds. They're taking uh, public ownership. They're taking a different approach, which might be worth considering. Um, I'll just go to the different pots here to give you, and I'm not sure, do we have a slide on this, on the timelines? I think we did. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we just currently, as Joy mentioned, we did do some workshops, um, and we're going to be proposing... Uh, we, we currently have out the rules on our adoption funding. This is a smaller pot, again, dealing with people actually signing up. And we're going to um, finalize those hopefully at the beginning of July and start taking applications. The bigger pot, uh, infrastructure grants, there's been a call uh, by the legislature to do more workshops. So we're going to propose at least uh, one here in Sacramento, I think is where we're at, and finalize those rules um, before the end of the year. And we still have money that we can disperse from our remainder, so it's not like we're stopping until November. So we're still granting funds, but the new rules will be finalized uh, by November and um, providing some more guidance, including one of the key areas that we have to really finesse is how we maximize the FCC funding that's going to the carriers and, and how this money is adding to those build-outs. Thank you so much for the presentation and help me out while I think out loud. So we should have, as you say, Joy, we should have as government, as public, build infrastructures in order to be a competitive state or country on one hand. On the other hand, we know we have carriers that want to definitely access us all in different shapes and forms. And then we have new technologies coming on top of um, our rural areas that we need these large ups and downs to be able to comply with all these amazing things that Silicon Valley is coming up with, but that we don't have the bandwidth for it. So they're going 10,000 miles per hour, and we're going like one mile per hour here, right? So our up and down is completely different. So there are 100 and we're one, literally. And I understand that UCPUC um, help us move a little bit the needle on with the carriers to engage more in some different shapes and forms. So they also put a piece of the investment into our rural areas. How do we help that be more? Because I believe they are, if they're interested, Sprint and uh, T-Mobile just announced a major big rural development and investment of $5 billion, if I'm not wrong. How do we engage them? Is it through the bill? Is it through regulators to make a little bit faster this move so we stay on the forefront of technology worldwide? I just came from Mexico, and Mexico has a little bit more of technology advanced than we do. And I was really shocked to see than we do in rural areas. Literally, they have three satellites reading per day everything that's going on on broadband. Yeah, it's actually um, a good question about both democracy and our reliance on markets. And I think you as a sector have always found really cooperative solutions to not always being completely 100% market-based, but often self-regulating, and some of that comes, you know, state down, and finding that common good. I do want to share that I just came back from China about a month ago, too, and it is ubiquitous there. And it is central planning, and they still have retail-level competition, but the infrastructure is everywhere. You pay, everything is on your 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 phone. You, every transaction is absolutely wireless in the most remote rural areas. Yeah. So I, I, how do we do it? I just didn't want to oversell the fact that it's not really, we're not the venue for that. I, I just, I have to, again, because I'm old, 
and because I used to represent public power districts and farmer-owned cooperatives, go back to what was needed and was transformative, and it was farmers coming together to create cooperatives. And I think going back to what Greg said, we have to get comfortable with public-private partnerships, that there are signals that can come from the PUC. But Joy, I disagree. I don't see the school districts doing something to work around the system. They've identified the need for their students to invest in their community, and they're using a tool that's readily available to them. And the entire community will benefit from that. So it does take, it takes people who see the need and are willing to work together and not afraid to try some unusual approaches to doing that. Um, and, and I just feel like you all said you wanted this topic today, and you all are leaders. So let's you all come together and be bold and, and, and really look at how to capitalize on this. I, can I mention one thing is, is that, so you're aware, even though California has a 6-1 standard, that doesn't mean we're going about building 6-1. Most of the projects come in that we fund are fiber projects. So the, it is state-of-the-art technology that we're funding. And that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that it's slow. We not, we're not getting enough applicants. And that's why the commissioner's proceeding is talking about innovation and, and, new, and having uh, staff look at all of our rules. The existing program, and I've been implementing it for a few years now since I took it over, it has some problems. It has, it's way too bureaucratic, has way too many stumbling blocks, and it makes it so I wouldn't want to be an applicant. So it, we need to make it more user-friendly, uh, we need to be uh, acting more quickly. One of the staff proposals that the commissioner is considering is a ministerial process. If a project meets certain criteria, boom, 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 staff has authority to approve the project. Doesn't have to go through months of negotiation, all this kind of stuff. And when, when it's outside the norm, then it goes to a commission for resolution. So we're very much a process organization. We want to reduce the bureaucracy as much as possible to get the job done. And that's kind of what we're focused on right now in terms of staff. What can we do to improve the program? Um, so, th and that's why I shared with you this data problem. And, and you're aware that one of the things the commission is, con is confronting is this issue, does mobile count? How do we count fixed wireless? Do we put those existing entities out of business when we fund a, uh, a tertiary fiber project in that area? And, and we see it on, in rehearing applications because we're getting blowback from people who are, who are threatened by these programs too. So it's, it's, it's not easy and it's not without controversy, but if we want to get there, there's going to be impacts and people are going to be affected in different ways. So I'd like to thank you both very much for coming today. As, as you know, I look at California, and we're known for our technology, and it's a it's a sad embarrassment to see where we are with broadband in the state, especially in the rural communities where we have students that can't do their homework, that can't access broadband. Uh, we want to implement technology on farm. We can't do it. Um, you're worried about a provider that, that that won't step up to the plate and provide access that we need. Then they should go away. It's pretty simple. You should run for the commission. Can I just say? So, so what, can we, what can we do to, to move things forward? I mean, yeah. we're about trying to get things accomplished. So what can we do? Well, one thing, actually, was it Martha? OK, so one thing you mentioned that is really important, which is the uh, opportunities. And we don't know what will happen with this T-Mobile Sprint um, merger, but that is a huge opportunity. And certainly. Um, your collective voice with the federal administration, potentially under our jurisdiction, that's still an open question. But th this is, uh, oftentimes those mergers can get far more than even this grant program. Because they're, currently, you're correct, they're marketing this as a benefit to rural America. And what does that mean for rural California? You absolutely have a voice in what that could mean for rural California. Um, and we could certainly work in collaboration with you on any technical or data issues that you would need to fill in your 
uh, request, if you will, or comments to the FCC. Um, so that's one thing. And kind of on the softer side, I think we're very interested in continuing to do as much outreach as possible, as much collaboration as possible. Sometimes uh, the carriers need kind of an anchor institution, if you will, a larger company, a larger public entity to really make the math work out with a little bit of our funding. So those are you know, more individualistic. We're trying to, Joy mentioned that, we're trying to do that. Um, I'm currently working on an effort, where Joy mentioned that all the consortias have given us their priority areas. We kind of have three existing priority lists, if you will, and we're trying to get to a place where we can at least kind of develop an action plan for ourselves of where do we want to really engage the carriers, where do we want to try to maximize the local consortia participation, and be a little more strategic with our limited funding. So that is something we can come back to you with to say, uh, did we miss anything? Do you offer any assets in these communities that we could go to the carriers on jointly? And that's gonna be an iterative process. So that will definitely be something that we can continue to work on together. Last comment, we've, we've got a... Yeah, you raise an excellent point, and and uh, I think the issue for us is that I'm confronting with my staff is how we measure what counts, right? So when we first, so the, there's a federal standard for measurement. Actually, the federal, California is ahead of the federal uh, FCC in terms of how we map and the validation we do. Our data shows is more accurate than the FCC. In fact, they are starting to model and ask questions and find out what we do here. So we're kind of advanced at the FCC and the CASF program is paying for this measurement and tool. So for example, on the mobile side, we don't just measure the mean average. So if you do OOKLA test, if you do speedtest.net and you measure broadband, it gives it spits back out an average speed. We test not only the local server, we have a server in Virginia, and we look at the delay that goes on backhaul. And we also look at mean minus two. But in other words, instead of just 50% up and 50% down below and above that mean average, we're looking at that service has to be available 98% of the time when you do the test. It's 20 tests upstream, 20 tests downstream, 40 tests, and we measure that. Has to be 98% of those have made the speed cut before we measure it. So our map is actually better than what the FCC shows. And, and still, it's a challenge. So I want to apply those same standards to the fixed wireless, and how do we do that? Um, so that will increase eligibility as we ramp up the, the, the raise the bar. As we raise the bar, fewer places will show eligible, I mean, as served, and more will be eligible for our program. And that's one of the issues we're confronted with right now. So I, I, the issue may not be do we count mobile or not. It may be are we doing a good enough job with measuring mobile and fixed wireless. Does that answer your question? Well, and I think it, it's kind of it may count here, but it may not count over here because over here it just doesn't have the bandwidth. And I would say that the question is really a time question. I think eventually we're all going to be able to count it, but we're not there yet in every part of California. And so it's going to vary. We're going to get applications. The applications are going to vary. In some geographies, it may be a competitive, real, real, uh, you know, service that competes. In others, as was said earlier, it, it's not going to, it's not a real service. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate your, uh, your presentations and your time today. Thank you. Uh, those uh, speakers are welcome to join us uh, in the room next door for lunch.
uh, and we'll be back at uh, 1245. So we have a hard deadline at 1245, board. We need to be back in here. They must have good broadband here. <laughs> <laughs>